All right. How's everybody doing? Good. Awesome. Today was beautiful. Yes. yes. Gorgeous. <laughs> yes, it was. Blue skies. Blue skies. And so nice and breezy. How many of y'all have a bunch of hummingbirds? I've got yeah. four. Yeah. I've got two. two. I have one. Awesome. I love it. I love hummingbirds. I do. Yes. They're awesome. We are going to go to Hebrews 11. I'm going to start with verse 1. And we're just going to dive on in. Is that okay? Yes. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we know when you look up that word, when it talks about evidence of things not seen, it's talking about the inner conviction that you have of the things you don't see yet. And, you know, a lot of people right now seem to struggle with really having those inner convictions. They seem to struggle with those places in their life. And look, we're, again, we're seeing people talking about the same things. And when Pastor Danny was preaching Sunday, and I encourage everybody to go back and watch it, something really stood out to me. That made sense. I, you know, when somebody can put words to it that you just don't know quite what it is. And the thing he was talking about was the crisis fatigue. And I thought, I've never heard of that like that before. And it's where, and, and this is what I wrote down. You've prepared, now, uh, now, you have prepared, and now the urgency isn't there, but you don't stop being ready or don't stop being prepared. And Dee and I were talking where, I get it, trying to put it together, but I've been in this place, it's like everything has been so, when the urgency's there, what do you do? You push. You, you push. Yeah. And we're going to talk about this pushing. And a lot of people are in a place, they're really not doing a lot of that right now. But what have we been doing? All of us have been somewhere doing something, what, some kind of pushing. And then all of a sudden, when you've pushed and completed, then it's like, okay, now what? Mm -hmm. And you feel like crickets. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, you know that. And then last night, we hear, I hear crickets, and I'm over there going, okay, that's not funny. <laughs> you know, because yeah. when I hear crickets, it's like, okay, it's like the silence. And that's all you hear are the crickets. Mm -hmm. And those can be distractions. Yes. Oh, annoying ones. <laughs> Very annoying. But I thought that was interesting because I hadn't heard it. And then he said, don't drop your guard. And I'm like, exactly. So many people do begin to drop their guard and they get relaxed. And so that's something I want to talk about tonight. Because I'm like, yeah, absolutely. But I've been in this place. It's like everything right now over this last month for me has just not, everything has changed. I had felt this shift. And it's just not a place of comfortable but my peace is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of things that have gone on in my personal life and everything, but I've noticed how it's affecting others too that are involved in this. And we're talking about when I, you know, with my sister and everything, you know, okay? We're, and in that, God began to show me so much. And it's interesting because are we not always supposed to be hearing the voice of God? Paying attention, he'll use every situation and circumstance to show you things show you where you need to heal, show you where you need to, look, come on, cinch up, come on. I mean, there's just a whole lot, and I'm like, this was different. This is different, and I haven't come out of it yet, so I know there's more to this, you know, there's, there's more. And some people aren't going to understand, and I know that. Doesn't mean I'm wrong. Right. Just because they don't understand. Mm -hmm. right. Because I'm not. I know I'm not because doesn't God tell us to trust him when we don't understand? No. Yes. Absolutely. When we're not sure, and this is where, as we call, this is the hall of faith. But I'm not talking about all that. I'm talking about something particular in this. So it says again, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Again, an inner conviction, for by it the elders obtained a good report. And when he's talking about the elders, he's talking about the ones in the Old Testament. Did they see those things come to pass? No, no. no, not at all. So through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Now, again, what does it say? Through faith. Did you see him frame the worlds? 
but do you trust that he did? Yes. So we're, and I'm going to challenge some things because we all have to be challenged in really where we're at in our faith and our belief. He says the words were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Huh. Isn't that interesting? But how much has the world tried to sit here and go, it was created this way? And they come up, they got some theories out there that are nuts. I've had people literally laugh at me because I was taught years ago, and it was in one of my college classes at one of the popular schools here in Oklahoma, where they taught, it wasn't even evolution. They taught that a fish came out of the water, it turned into a cow over time, blah, blah, blah. And I laughed. And I got sent to the back. That was one of the reasons I got sent to the back of the class because I'm like, no, that's not how that happened. Where did y'all get this? And then I found out, and this was years and years ago, and then I found out probably about three months ago someone else had been taught the same thing. And I said, see, I knew I wasn't making that up because you think over time, did I really remember, did I really remember that correctly? But it does show you, again, some people it's new, but me, it was brought out, what, years ago? So it tells you it's out there. You Just because we haven't heard it or seen it doesn't mean it's not there. Right. Just like the things God created, I may not have heard about it, I may not have seen it, but does that mean it's not there? If God created it, it doesn't matter, right? But this is where the more we get in the Word and the more we learn about the Word, the things you didn't see yesterday, <clears throat> He's wanting you to see today. Yeah. And you have to be constantly seeking those things which is going to require you to come up and it's also going to challenge your what? Carnality. Yeah. The carnal self. The flesh. And then Pastor Danny also said something that I thought was interesting. Uh, we'll go to it here in a little bit, but I went back and the Lord spoke to me in that and it goes along with tonight, so I'll go back in a little bit with that one. So he goes on and says, verse 4, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts. Who did? God did. Yeah. And by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he what? Please God. Well, if Enoch walked with God, he didn't see death. Enoch's purpose is not done. Right. Yes. And uh, and we know somebody else's purpose that is not done. Mine. Come on. See, we we go to the Bible and we look at all them. What about you? Yep. What about your purpose? Mine's not done. I'm still here walking. Mm -hmm. I I won't see death. Hello. Can I stretch your thinking a little bit? Yes. I won't see death. My vessel possibly but I don't believe so because you know what what do we what are we called to do usher in what Return. 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 do you really believe that yes. is tomorrow promised no. hmm but yet why do we want to play with tomorrow and tomorrow never comes just saying okay so let's stretch our thinking we look at this we see Enoch Enoch's purpose he has one did Elijah he was taken up, right? Mm -hmm. His purpose is not done. Right. Well, mine's not either. Yeah. It is not done. Do you believe that Paul's purpose is done? I don't, because it's what? He's in the Word. Does he tell stories? Does he show things? Does he talk about things? Is there still purpose there? Yes. Come on now. See, sometimes we look at this as so much of a storybook, we say the end when they're gone. But I learned something from every one of them. As they're still what? Walking here. Walking here. This is alive. Is it not? Mm -hmm. The word is alive and living. Right? Yes, I'm going to stretch you. It's okay. <coughs> it has to be. Right? Yes. It has yep. to be okay. So then we go on and it says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now there's where I want to stop. 
it says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. What kind of faith is he talking about? He's talking about the faith he's given us, correct? Not the faith that you have for things of the world. See, people keep running to the world and take trying to take their faith and, and get results of the world. I'm taking my faith before the Father because I want his results. Okay? So many people are sitting there and they think, okay, you know, I mean, if I do... Okay, look at a hustler. Can we look at a hustler? Some at hustles. Are they going to God for their manifestation or are they going what? They're trying to find a way to make it happen through what? The world's way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So whose faith do they really have? It ain't God's faith. Mm -hmm. they, they have their, it's faith in themselves. Mm -hmm. It's selfish faith. It truly is. Okay? So here he says that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do you realize so many people never see anything accomplished in their lives? Because they stop, start too many projects, or stop some, start something. Get here. I believe. I believe God wants. You know, why don't you do this? I believe God wants. No, God gave it to you. You do it. But then all of a sudden, there's going back and forth. So when someone does that to me, I tend to think, Oh, you're not settled in yourself, really. Right. You're not settled in who you are. Why did? Why do you want me to do something? If you see the need, why don't you do it? Mm -hmm. Why are you pushing it off on somebody else? Mm -hmm. But God said he's a rewarder of those that diligently what? Seek see. him. So if you want to qualify for what he has, and you know he's called you to do something, here's the deal. You have to be so completely committed to pressing forward all the way until you have literally completed the assignment. Is your assignment completed yet? No. There is different legs of the assignment, right? Mm -hmm. Just like in growth, you hit what? You hit growth spurts, you hit growth markers, whatever. You filled your, okay, I'm five years old now. Okay, there I am, I'm five. Now I'm 10, whatever it is. And in between, what do you fulfill and what do you complete in those stages, in those places? See, here's what's happened so many times. People have for really, truly have walked away, so many people, from what God has originally called them for purpose to do because it's not happening in their timing. Mm -hmm. They're not experiencing or seeing what crisis fatigue is. And that hit me. That really did because I look back at my life, and I look back in ministry years ago when I got born again, my heart was to sit here and minister to the community. It was to feed people. It was to, I mean, do something for the community. And I mean, I didn't realize the city came against me. I went to get permit. I went to get, because I didn't know that we're sovereign, we're a church. Didn't know that because it wasn't taught. Because they didn't know it either. And so many don't. See, I'm watching so many people being confined and restricted and it's by their own bondages by lack of knowledge does that make sense it's what they don't know so anyway i kept persisting and i kept persisting and i was like you know what i'm going to do this regardless i know what god told me and it was over at frank knight park i knew what god that was like my big thing people don't know how huge that was for me because i was just i wasn't born again that long but boy, I was hungry and I was ready to do something and make a difference. So then it wasn't just the city council coming against me. It was all the other government offices in the city. And I went to the pastor, I'm like, you gotta help me here. For me to do this, it's like everything. The funny thing is, donations kept coming in, money kept showing up, so none of that was a big thing. That wasn't the issue. It was dealing with what? The same thing Jesus dealt with, government. The ones that have no position or place in the church. 
So I persisted, and because I, it was lack of knowledge, I found grace in his eyes because he made a way for it. Somebody that worked there, and I can say this because this was years ago, <laughs> snuck in a document and got a signature for me, and that's all I needed. She didn't tell me that till later. <laughs> I did not know that. But you know, God will do anything to do what he wants done. Amen. And in that, <clears throat> nobody from the church except one couple would help me. <clears throat> I set it up by myself, took it down by myself. Well, at Michael, he, he was able, he was working, but he was able to help where he could. But as far as other people, no. So during the day, it was me. The couple was down at the church cooking 600 hamburgers, 600 hot dogs. That's how much food was donated. I mean, it, I, we had over a $1,000 because we had games. It was like a carnival type setting. And I tell you what, that did something for me. But what I also got to watch, and it was hard for me to understand, is those that came in at the, the most biggest successful part of the day and then want to walk in and be a part of it. I'm like, I didn't handle it right. I know that now. Then I thought, I was like, oh, no, you didn't. But again, it's one of those things that I can't worry about you and I gotta do what I'm supposed to do. If you wanna come in and you wanna take kudos for it, whatever, that's between you and God because that's where it stops right there. As you said, that's where the buck stops right there. This is for God's glory. This is for what God wants to do. And ever since then, I would push forward and I, I would pursue. And one of the things that helped me is when I got to volunteer at Billy Graham's crusade, and that was a huge step for me. And I didn't want nobody going with me. I said, it's a fear I have to face, and I want to do this. And then God put me in a position, in a place, literally, that I wanted to be in. And I was like, this is awesome. And it gave me what I needed to really see a vision of something bigger. But see, I had to desire it, and I had to seek it, and I had to want it. See, not, a lot of people, because of what they're seeing right now, they're really not seeking. They're really not desiring. They're really not wanting the purpose that God has because it doesn't look like what they want it to look like. You know? I'm going to tell you, we're in a time and a season God created us for. It's not going to be all pretty. But it's going to be powerful. And people are going to see what God really, truly looks like and who his children really are. And it may not look pretty, but it doesn't matter. I'm glad I get to be a part of it. But the thing is, I have to what? I have to continually, continually to seek him. Be diligent. Because diligence is nece it's absolutely necessary. First, to see a dream, to see a vision, or a calling come to pass. Many of us can get a glimpse of a vision, right? But what are you going to do to bring it to pass? Well, God's going to do it. No, he's not. You are. He's going to give you what you need to see it. And so many people think the way that it, they're doing it, oh, it, it don't take all that. Yes, it does because go, and we'll look at some in the Bible to show that. <clears throat> so here when he says diligently seeking those who seek God and his will, you will be rewarded. It's a guarantee. He said what? He's a rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek him. But are you seeking for the reward? Because if you are, guess what? There it is. That's your reward. You know what I'm saying? It's really a hard thing. Diligently seek is a translation. And it means literally to seek out. It means to seek for something with all of your heart with all of your strength, with everything in you. And some people go, oh, it don't take all that. Yes, it does. Because I want what he wants. Right? And it's work. It truly is. But if we're sitting here laying around all the time, just doing nothing, and if somebody used to tell me eating bonbons, <laughs> you're not going to get anywhere. And I remember that was a phrase they used for years, and I'm like, you like bonbons, don't you? And they're like, yeah, I do. I was like, okay. But people don't understand what it truly means to seek him. It's just diligently. 
That means with everything you've got, everything in you, that means I'm not to seek my own will. I want to seek his will. And I tell you what, when you start seeking his will, you will find the fun in it. You'll find the work in it. You'll be tired, but it'll be a good tired. And you'll find the joy. You'll find things in you that you didn't know because it's part of the fruit of the Spirit. But until you can dive in to connect to those things, you won't experience them. People want to put down patience. Oh, man, the best thing to diligently seek him. Oh, he'll help you with the patience. And then when something's completed, you'll think, you'll be like, I'm so, literally, I'm so proud of me because what? I was patient in this. I've been long-suffering in this. Woo! You know? All right. It gives you the, the basically shows a, tells us that it's being hardworking. You have to be attentive. It has to be constant. It has to be persistent. And stop letting people distract you with the small things when God's speaking. That's why some people get upset, but if I'm listening to God, I'm not trying to be rude, but sometimes if he's downloading something, I have to listen. And then when I'm done, it's like, oh, let me share this. So I'm going to keep it. So why would I? No, let me share it. That's why I like when we're able to share things. like, man, I got this. I got this from Sunday. I got this from Wednesday. I got this from Tuesday. Man. And it goes back to also whenever we talk or teach, we go back and God starts downloading more. And I'm like, yeah, keep it up. And right now, I think that's that place I'm uncomfortable, but yet I know God's doing something. I really do. So if we sit here and we take the, what God has given us, our assignment lightly, and come at it with this relaxed attitude, you're not going to go far in fulfilling your call. You just aren't. It does take hard work to achieve anything. And complaining about how hard it is won't make it any easier. I know, because what happens when you complain? You'll get caught up in that, and then everything, what? You're making it harder than it really is. I, and that was a big thing for me. So we have to literally resolve within ourselves, make a decision. We're going to do this. So if we're serious about doing what he's told us to do, then guess what? You have to adjust your level of commitment every step of the way. What do you mean? Well, it's just like, okay, Lord, I'm committed to doing this. You achieved that goal. Now you have to adjust your commitment to what? The next part, because it's much given, much it's required. required. So it doesn't get less as you go. It gets more. I love it because he trusted us to do it, or we wouldn't be here, right? Right. So if you don't believe in yourself, he did because he created you for such a time as this. But if you're just blowing it off, well, then don't get mad at everybody else if they're achieving what God's called them to do, right? Mm -hmm. People tend to do that and get jealous. It's interesting where jealousy comes in and people don't see it. People really don't get it. People will sit there and get jealous. Yeah, I've seen this. People get jealous if all of a sudden all the attention is taken off of them and put onto something else because God is shifting. Okay, I'll give you an example. You're working on a project with somebody. You've been doing it for years, okay? The project is part of the vision, but the project is over. So now we've got to shift to the next project. You might be part of that project, but it may not, you may not be the main character right now. So as that visionary shifts and finds the main characters for this project, you can't get jealous if it's right. not on you. Right. If you do, that's incorrect, that's out of order because that shows, oh, I'm selfish. Yep. It really does. And I know because I've dealt with that. Especially, and this is where you gotta get, be careful being too familiar with people to the place that you can't let them move in the vision <clears throat> and move with their part of it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. 
So this is where, and he comes home, tells us about things at work that take place, and people get jealous. Well, how can you do this? How can you do that? Well, because of me, was the Bible say? Man that finds what? A wife finds a good thing. And obtains favor from the Lord. Because of the good thing. <laughs> Not just a thing, but a good thing. And he'll tell people that, and they go, you call her a thing? He I said, did. I did. The Bible did. And I said, he has to be reminded. You know, I'm just saying. <laughs> and ladies, there's nothing wrong with that. And a lot of ladies feel that that's, Oh, that's just kind of boisterous. No, that's what the Bible says. You gotta add the good to it. Yeah, exactly. you gotta put the good to it. And guess what? Who what are we? We are what? We are good wives. We are a good thing. Yes, yes. we are. <laughs> but the thing is <laughs> the thing is, people people tend to forget who God's placed in their life to walk out the purpose and walk out the vision. Why would he bring a couple together and for them not to have walk out in the same vision? Come on. Right. But you got to be careful because there can be some battling going on in the process. Why? Because you're growing, she's growing, he's growing, whatever. And in those places, you're going to have, what, hiccups, right? Mm-hmm. But if you keep looking to him and diligently seeking him, what happens? You don't look in the bumps and all that. You look at what? Okay, God, how can we make this happen? Right. How can we do this? Right? Absolutely. So, again, if we take it lightly, you know, we're not going to achieve what we need to. We have to uh, be literally hard workers. It's just part of being diligent. If you want to see your dreams come true or the visions fulfilled, you have to give your full attention to what God has called you to do. But again, is he going to call you as a married couple outside of? He's going to call you together. Right. So why don't you sit down together and why don't you seek it together? Right? Now that doesn't mean that he won't give you something or you something. That's when you sit down and say, okay, let's bring this together. Let's talk about this because I got this, I got this. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. It has to have our full and undivided attention. It does. That's why he tells us not to be unequally yoked with who? Unbelievers. 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 Because you can't, you, there's no way you're going to be able to do this. Right. So, when, we're, when you're seriously pursuing us, we won't have time for wrong attitudes and wrong thinking. There ain't no time for that. W what if I do? Don't you trust him enough to check you? Don't you trust your others? Can they not come to you and can they not check you? Sure. Come on now. See, that's something else I keep, I keep hearing is so many people are like, but we want to win them to Christ. Yes, but if you go back and look at Jesus, he told them truth and love. That's right. He didn't want to sit here and stroke their ego. He didn't want to say, well, I know you're going through a hard time, but no. He told them truth. But That's so right. many people get offended by the truth, so that tells me something. Mm -hmm. When I get offended, what does that tell me? I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And i got to fix it. Right. But a lot of people don't want to do that. They don't want to hear that. In fact, I had to deal with something this last weekend. Oh, another part of that growing, something was said to me, and I stopped, and I was like, excuse me? And they were like, well, I mean, you do this and you do that. And I'm like, oh, see, they don't understand the concept every situation stands on its own. <laughs> so I know what you're saying, but you don't get it, so I can't talk to you about it. You don't get it, so I'm not explaining it. Right. You're not in a position because you're already offended by what I said. Right. So, again, we have to look. We're in this place and this time. And when he was talking about this crisis fatigue, you got to really do. you got to be careful and not let your guard down and not stop. You still pursue. Do you stop seeking just because you're not doing anything? There's no movement at the moment? Absolutely not because what do you do? You diligently seek him so he can tell you the news before the news to be prepared for the next. 
So, now, this was something else when I was studying on this, and he said, does it stop because I don't feel like it? Does the purpose of God stop because I don't feel like it? I don't feel like it today. I can still rest and pursue and diligently seek the Father if I need rest. He doesn't want me wearing myself out, but i got to make sure that I don't get caught up. You know what I'm saying? You can't be laying around all the time. And when you are resting and doing what you need for your body and for yourself, you're still seeking. You don't stop. You never stop. Everybody good? Yeah. Okay. Oh. So being constant and consistent is also needed. Listen, being constant, being consistent. It's needed to diligently pursue what God has called you to do. If we constantly continue to go back and forth, and some people, I don't agree with this, but some people do say this. But, well, I believe one day and I don't another. Well, you can't be in and out of your faith. You can't be in and out of your belief. Either you believe or you don't. So basically, you don't believe. Just because today is not doing what you want it to do doesn't change what he said. And I know that because when I get upset and, and yeah, when I get angry about certain things, I take it back to the word. And I'm like, Lord, you said. And I, me and God have a conversation based on the word, not based on what I'm feeling in the moment. It's got to go back to the word because that's where my correction comes. That's where I have to remind myself. Come on. Have you not had those conversations? Absolutely. They're tough. But you got to be honest and be mature enough and willing to do those things and then fix and correct the very thing you're saying. And we're going to look at that too. I got, I got scripture for that too. So this is where we are held accountable to everything that God has called us to do. If we continue going back and forth, we're never going to have results of anything for the kingdom of God. So to produce these results, we again have to be constant in our commitment. How many people know somebody will get committed to something after the honeymoon stage? It's over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come on. Why? You've gotten relaxed. You've gotten comfortable. I don't ever, I'll, I'll be honest, that's something I don't want to. I don't want to get out of what they call the honeymoon stage. Why should I? Who said that? Who said I have to? The world did. So anytime I'm in a project, whether it's canning, whether it's gardening, because I'm learning, that's all having to come back to me. Whatever it is I'm committed to, I want to stay committed to it. So what do I have to do? I'm the one that stirs that up. So every day I go out and I talk to my plants. I say, how you doing? You sure are looking pretty. My neighbors probably think I'm with me, but I talk to my plants. I do. I have. I do because I speak the word and I speak truth over them. If I'm going to have dominion, how do you do that? By your word. Yeah. So you better find out what you're trying to have dominion over. Just like with the storms and everything. I went out and I, I was told storms, I understand what's up, but let me tell you who I am. And this is who God created me to be. So here, you're, here this is who we are. I love it. And people, and like I say, you hear, I know my neighbors are probably going, Oh my gosh, she's just a she's little out there touched. Again. I don't care. I don't care. Just hear me. I'm getting results. Hello. Right? You know? Hey, and your neighbor's benefiting from those results. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, we have to really fully understand that we have to be so unchanging, steadfast, fixed. Persistence is a key to remaining diligent. When you're persistent, that means you don't give up and you're not giving in. How many things in your life are you right now, if you're honest with yourself, that you're fighting that are worldly? Somebody's trying to come against something that's worldly in your life. Come on now, it's carnal. But they're trying to bring truth, this to you, and you're resisting. That's the wrong kind of resisting. You need to turn that around for the kingdom. You're not supposed to be resisting him. 
You're supposed to be resisting them. So you got to be honest because some of us are. I know when I deal with something, I'm like, oh, man. All right, Lord, got to fix it. So with, with standing opposition, adversity, whatever, it's just part of the walk. So every time something happens, don't give up. Don't give it. Oh my God. I believe me, I know. I've been there. <laughs> it's like it's too hard. And God's like, you're making it hard. I'm giving you the way out. You know, that goes back to the scripture we talked about here a while back when he says he doesn't give us more than we can bear because he gives us what? A way out. Right? He, people want to use that, and they sit there and say, well, God won't give me more than I can bear. Well, no, he won't. He gives you the what? The way out. So what are you doing? Are you being weighty? Are you the one putting the weight on there? Because it's not God. Is it? No, it's us. So when we talk about being persistent, it means to remain. It means to attend constantly. And commitment is required to live and walk in faith. That's commitment. Now, if you want to casually approach every situation and not give your 100%, then don't be upset with what? The results that you get. Yeah. Right? Diligence is a requirement to get to a place of completion, fulfillment, victory. So you have to ask yourself, are you really diligently doing this? So now we're going to go back. We're going to go to Hebrews 10. Everybody still good? Yes. And I'm going to just start at verse 19 for because of time and everything. <clears throat> it says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter in to the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now, how many people have heard others say, Well, we can't enter into the holy of holies? I have. But didn't Jesus make that way? Yes, he did. So, see, that's not, that's not a reason either. You know what I'm saying? He made a way for us to, what, enter in to the Holy of Holies. By a new and living way, verse 20, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And I had saw a picture years ago when I studied about the veil. When he died on the cross, the veil was rent, right? Yes. I finally saw a picture the other day that actually was the closest thing that I've ever seen when it came to the veil. Because of the height, the thickness, and everything else. And knowing just by his death what that did. And I'm like, man, I didn't have to do that. He did that for me. So I have complete access. So if a Christian says they don't, that's not correct. That's not true. You have complete access. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in what? Full assurance of what? Faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Right? Mm -hmm. So here we're going to look at this. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised so the word profession comes from a, a, the Greek word and it's actually a compound of two words and some people get really deep with it but basically what it's saying this word translates to agreement because it's talking about Coming in agreement with his word. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. When you come in agreement. Okay. I'll just explain it this way. 
my words are my thoughts, right? Are your words your thoughts? Whatever you speak, that's what you're thinking, right? My words are my thoughts. They're my convictions and my beliefs. Right? Because what you think, as a man thinketh what? So is he. So is he. So then, if I read the Bible and I agree with his word, because profession, the second part of the word, is talking about words. It's from logos. It's words. So here, if I agree with what is written, then basically I'm coming in agreement because of those words. And those words are what? Jesus. They're from God, right? They're God-breathed. They're his words. Yes? Yes. Okay. So catch this. I know it's simple, but it, you got to really chew on this to really get this because how many times do we keep telling people when they say certain things, they go, my gosh, every time I say something, I get corrected. Well, we're trying to get you to come into agreement with his word. Because again, my, my words come from my thoughts, my convictions, my beliefs. Right? So as a man thinketh, so is he. If you think sickness all the time, what are you going to say? Sick. What's your conviction? What's your belief? What's your words? They come from what? Your thoughts. See, people got to understand how powerful these things really are in our life. So, when we come to his word, then and we sit here and we believe this word, then we think that what he thinks, we believe as he believes, and what he is what? Expressed as what? An author does with a book. How many of you go, okay, I know a lot of readers. I know a lot of people love to read. And I ask them, what are you reading? Because what's happening? If you start getting into what you're reading and start agreeing with it, and you like it, you start like, look, I know the big thing used to be the Harlequin romance novels for some of the young girls. Why? Because it created a picture. It created a picture for them. A picture that was not true. A picture that took them into a fantasy land. A picture that made them compromise who they really were because, well, wait a minute. They never, I read the book and I didn't do anything according to the book. I said, but did your thoughts? And so did you. Come on. Because what begins to happen? You play those things, those scenarios over and over. You start what? Believing them. And then you can't see the reality that's sitting before you. I know I've been there. You see what you desire. That's why I want to desire him. I desire his thoughts, his ways. But I can't do that until I do that, right? So again, if I read the Bible, I agree with what is written. Now, how do I agree with that? It's gotta be by what? Faith, mm -hmm. right? Come on. If I had to do this within myself, Lord, if this is Jesus himself, then I believe him. But I had to what? I had to resolve myself to that, to knowing that's true. And then let God show up and show out in the process of it. Because it had to be done by what? Faith. Look at the ones in the Old Testament. Remember, a lot of them, they never saw what God told them. But did they believe him? They made it to the hall of faith. Of course they did. But see, what you read, what you listen to, what you take in, is what you believe. It really is. And if you believe that you can't, I want to know why you believe that. Because the Bible says all things are possible to those who believe, right? That means you can do... Now, I'm not talking about the world stuff. I'm talking about God's stuff. 
if you, all things are possible to him that believes, right? I can do anything that God has called me to do because I believe it, right? But how many of us, there is an area that we don't believe because we're still struggling with it in our mind. And how do I know you are? Because I hear you talk about it. I hear you speak about it. That's why for me, if I find myself go to speak something, I'm like, oh, where'd that come from? Well, I know where it came from. I know where it came from. Who said that? See, you gotta identify with who said that. Did someone say it and you took that as your truth? Did the enemy whisper it in your ear and you took that as the truth? Or did you say it because it looks impossible and you believe that is your truth? See, again, everybody still good? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you like and agree with what is written here, if, if, if this grabs you, because some people don't like everything they read. Mm -hmm. All right. Come on. Mm -hmm. And when they don't like it, do they want to agree with it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know what you have to do at that moment? I don't care if I like it or not. This is truth, and that's what matters, and I'm yes. going to believe that. And I'm, I tell you what, mine, you get to line up. Mm -hmm. And how do I do that? By continually getting in the Word, continually yeah. seeking Him, continually going and doing If you said I can do this, Lord, I don't see a way, but you said I'm going to keep going in, and I'm going to keep finding out. Just like with anything else, if someone tells you that you can't do something, and I've done this, especially when I know God said I could, I ask them, who told you that? Who told you I couldn't do that? You better tell them shut up. You better tell them be quiet. And 10 to 1 odds, it's because their belief is not there. Mm -hmm. I can't go off their belief. I can't go off of what they think they believe. I'm so, I have to go off what I believe. Again, I've read things in here I didn't like. And I'm like, I don't like it. Doesn't matter if I like it or not. I know it's truth. I resolved it. See, some things you do get to do and make a decision for yourself that you're going to believe this is true. Don't ask God to do it for you. God, please, make me believe. And they use that one scripture about, Lord, help me with my unbelief. I, right? And it's like, no, what do you, what are you sold out on? You have to literally answer. Do you believe you're made whole? According to the Bible, yes. Or am I perfect? According to the Bible, yes. Am I a sinner? According to the Bible, no. Right. <laughs> but that's not what it says. But you don't have understanding because you don't study. You don't you don't sit there and you don't chew and you don't meditate. When when I do mess up and I miss the mark. Okay, I had the opportunity, what? To fix it. It's up to me. I don't ask God to fix it. Come on. Right. This goes to that place where God's got it. God's in control. No, he, no. He gave it to you. Yep. But so many people want, it's a cop out. Mm -hmm. People have gotten, again, they're not fulfilling their call because they've gotten lazy about it. They've gotten lazy about the word. And then people go, so many people are just church hurt. I said, yeah, over truth. That's the saddest part of it all. Now, I've been church hurt. I know what some of that does look like. But I also know that, yeah, I, I was hurt in the church, but it was because of me. It was because I didn't know the truth. And when I found it out, it didn't feel good. It challenged me. So what did I do? You fix it. It's growing pains. I don't know why people think this walk is just, you know, we're going to fly by. So if you agree with what's written here, then you are coming in agreement with him. So guess what can take place once you come in agreement? Something's going to happen. Right? That's what happens, unfortunately, with so many things going on right now because of all the junk out there that people are reading and listening to. They're coming in agreement with that, and then they're wondering why their lives are in chaos because you came in agreement with chaos. You came in agreement with lies. You came in agreement with all these things, and that's not who we are. We know who we are. We are sons. We are daughters. That's who we are. And 
people out there, they don't know who they are as a person. Some of them forgot their own name. They did. I'm telling you, it's sad. So, if you take his viewpoint and you begin to hold it as your own conviction, totally sold out to it, it won't be long until you and God are aligned, not just in your thinking, but also your believing. But it's got to start somewhere. And look, too many people think, well, it's okay if I do this, or it's okay if I do that. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Stop making excuses because that don't work. Right. It just doesn't work. When you get these words deep in you, they become your conviction, and now you are so much in agreement with him. Now, in 1 Timothy 6.13, just write it down. Whenever the word profession is used, it's used here as confession. And that means that you are both, you are speaking to the same conclusion. You've come in agreement with God. You are now in agreement with Him and you've already spoken the conclusion of a matter. And it's the Word. Right? What did God give you? And God said, be sold on it. I need you sold on it. Well, some people, they confess, they confess, they confess. Well, you've made it a machine now. That ain't working. That's not how that works. You got to get it in you. But you got to tell yourself, I believe it. See, that's the thing. That's the difference. I know I've been there. It's not, this, this word, when it talks about confession, is not a person that simply just repeats what someone else says. This is someone who has gotten God's word so much into their heart that they've come into agreement or alignment with what he says. Doesn't the Bible say that you'll have what you say? What was it you were saying early, uh, yesterday about why does the Bible say when I speak to my mountain, it's about what? Move. Yeah. Do you speak those things? Well, that's kind of a... No, speak them. He was saying that to little David. Yeah. yeah. About do mountains have ears? Yeah. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. yes. That was, yeah. But people don't understand. We have proven... This right here, by speaking to what? The atmosphere. Jesus proved it by not what? He got up, he was sleeping on a pillow, and he gets up and he goes, you know he was looking at them disciples, and he just said what? Peace. And he showed us what happens when you come in agreement and alignment with the word itself. He was the word what? In flesh. You literally, when you see everything like God sees it, you hear it like he hears it, you feel it like he feels it, now you two are so in agreement and the unity that's there on any issue, man, and you start confessing the God's word, guess what? Your confession is no longer powerless. It's no longer empty chatter. It really comes from such a deep place within you that you can what? Move mountains. That's one thing I have learned as so many times situations I would have handled one way and we've had conversations over the years. And it's like, no, nah, you know, Danny, they will be all talking and Danny's like, well, no, let it, let it take care of itself. I'm like, what does that mean? I'm just saying. And then I have found when I stay out of it and do just that, there are some things that what? They remove themselves. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they're not talking faith. They're not talking the word. And there comes a time, it's not for us to say anything. There comes a time you do speak. But you have to find that out. But if you're not in this, constantly seeking him, seeking the word, getting it in you, you're not going to know those situations. And I like that when I see somebody that literally I can see manifestation, a fruit from something that I'm like, ooh, I get, oh, okay, I like that. Let's do that. Let's see how that works. I don't find that sometimes it doesn't work too well. Sometimes <laughs> it does. It just depends on what? The situation. And not everybody may handle it the same. That doesn't mean if you get fruit from it, guess what? Praise the Lord. Next time, God may do something a little different. 
you know? So real confessions, true real confessions are made out of words from God that has been, what, in us. But this takes those places of renewing our mind. This takes the place of meditating. And we have to start seeing what God sees. And it's beyond what we see naturally. You know? Okay. When you come into alignment with him, you no longer, really, you can't utter empty words because if you're in alignment with him, you should see something every time you speak. Right? You should see something. So many people make a mistake of continually repeating what they've heard someone else say, and they never develop. And remember, that's that place of mechanics. They never develop their faith. Mm -hmm. And I know I did that for years. And I was like, man. And then one day the Lord spoke to me when I was doing corporate prayer. And when he spoke to me, it shifted everything for me. And I never did it through the mechanics again. I did it believing I'm going to say something. You're going to tell me what I need to either say, what I need to release, give me understanding. So when I pray, I don't pray just to say, oh, Lord. No, I pray with purpose and knowing he's going to what? Respond. I have no doubt. Even when I pray in tongues, I can pray in tongues and I can pray just a few minutes and I'll get my answer. Boom, there it is. I'll get something, boom, there, scripture, whatever it is. But that's, a, that's taking the time to do it, to develop it. So, real quick, because of time, I'm going to read something here. Faith confession can only be a real mountain-moving confession when it comes again from the heart before it comes out of the mouth. Again, you plant God's word in you, then what comes out of you is going to be powerful. But you have to what? You've got to get it in you before you can get it out of you. So I wanted to look at something. I was looking at leaders in the Bible. And I like this, and I just kind of wrote them down real quick. And these are 12 leaders, representations of leaders in the Bible. Noah. Leaders do what's right, even if they're alone. Abraham, leaders embrace the unknown. Joseph, leaders endure in spite of circumstances. Moses, leaders stick up for their people, even though we know Pharaoh had something to do with all that too. But Moses had to what? He had to be, make the step. <coughs> Joshua, leaders rule by example. David, leaders are not afraid of giants. Isaiah, leaders rise to the occasion. Daniel, leaders maintain their resolve without regard to consequence. John the Baptist, leaders aren't afraid to call out the phonies. Peter, leaders recover from failure. Paul, leaders are passionate for what they believe in. Jesus, leaders are servants. And I thought that was so awesome when I read that. And there was breakdowns of all that, but I didn't. I just liked that because I was like, man, 12 leaders, and it showed. And guess what? If you read all of that, it was selfless. It was not selfish in any form or fashion. Because if they were, would they have been able to do what they did? Nope. No, not at all. But it also shows us what we can do too. And we're all called. But here's another thing, too, the Lord was talking about. Was, you know, so many people want to look at this hierarchy of position and this and this and this where the church has become so legalistic and all these things. It's like, you know what? I'm called as part of the body. And I'm going to do my spot and in my spot, that's where God wants me. It doesn't matter. If I'm a pinky, I'm a pinky. If I'm a kneecap, okay. It does not matter as long as what? I'm in it. But then that means I have a specific purpose and I owe it to the body to do it. Right. I do. Once I tell Jesus yes, then what? Now I owe it to him. And I owe it to the body. That's part of this. Some people, no, well, no, it's true. It's true. So real quick, something that also the other day, um, in 1 Thessalonians 5, real quick. 
And I, I do want to look at this one. In verse 9, and Pastor Danny brought this up, and I, and I wrote this down. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And when he said that, we, that God hadn't appointed us to wrath, and that word appointed means what? To establish, to fix, to set. And here was the question that I heard the Lord ask. He said, if I have not appointed them to wrath, then why do they want to appoint it to others? <clears throat> and I just sat there, and I had to chew on that. Because what's wrath? Punishment, <clears throat> anger. And I was like, wow. And then doing that which is good may hurt. And that was something I took, too. I was like, wow. But when he showed me that, this is one of the moments that I had to step back, and I was like, wait a minute. If God hadn't done it, then why are we doing it? If there's things that, when we look at the Word of God and we see what God did, why aren't we doing it? And if God didn't do it, then why are we doing it to others? See, you got to, this, again, is about fulfilling purpose. And I've looked at that, and I've looked at that, but that hit me. I was like, wow, if I've not appointed them to wrath, then why did they appoint it on others? And I was like, man. And do you know that's the thing that also happens that begins to stir up strife and everything else? You know? People begin to, that goes back to that selfish thing, that jealousy thing. What happens when the world, you don't, you don't do what they want to do, and so they go try to get your friends and turn your friends on you? And I'm just using this as an example. But, you know, that's also something, too, that the body is allowed in as well. Well, they don't, they don't let me do. And actually, I've learned here that is not true. As long as it lines up with the Word, that door is open for you to walk in your gifts and your calling. So guess what? You have to be what? develop and that's the part people struggle with they think you're attacking them and that's not it at all for us to be developed in our gifts and callings we have to be what corrected we have to be instructed we have to be directed i have not obtained all that yet and i'm learning that more and more every day but it also we have to understand the power of our confession and what we speak and what we say not just to ourselves, but to one another. I'm just saying. That's something we really need to think about. Now, I understand somebody was being ugly the other day, and I'm just sitting there, and the Lord said, ah, they can be ugly all they want. It won't hurt them. I won't let it. They belong to me. It may not feel good listening to it, hearing it, but they'll be all right, I'll handle it. I'm like, okay, you do that. How many of us want to sometimes just jump in and defend? And God's like, let me do it. Because maybe he's doing something in their life and wants them to see him as what? Their protector. Wants to, he wants them to see him. Because see, here's another thing. If we keep wanting to run to people to save us, how are we going to ruin him? That's true. That doesn't mean I can't come talk to somebody. It doesn't mean I can't. But there's some things that I've got to go straight to God about. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Yep. And then, once I think I get my answer, then I may go to somebody and say, hey, can I talk to you? you know, I just want to make sure I'm hearing correctly. I want to make sure I'm, you know. They may know, they may not. But in that process, I may get more answers. But we have to go to him first. Right? Mm -hmm. And like I said, here, the doors have been opened to people many, many times. Come on in, we'll do what we, and then here comes the grooming part. Ooh. But it's, you gotta have it, right? Everybody good? Yep. Okay, we're gonna stop right there.